Okay, so I'm doing the review of kind of all the other stuff, which includes Mm, now it's not going to move forward. There we go. Okay, which includes billing and coding, some ethics, elements of professional liability, government requirements, physician reporting and profiling, and some statistics at the end. And there are some questions mixed in. Um, so please feel free to help answer those. This is a brief overview, and I hope mostly helpful for what you guys need for the CREOG. And then after you guys take it, if you think of any questions in this topic that I didn't cover, let me know and I'll try to add it. Um, they did update the CREOG objectives and a lot of this stuff isn't included in there, but they seem to test on it. So we'll just keep trying. Okay, so some billing basics, just so you remember, a new patient is greater than three years not seen in your practice and that includes your partners. New patient codes are gonna be the 01 to 05 codes and then established patient codes are gonna be the one, one, one to one five codes. And there's some modifiers that you guys should remember too, because um, I know they've asked about that before. So 25 is to add a, pr a procedure to a visit, like an IUD insertion. So if they came in for birth control, you counseled them that day, and they want it the same day, that would be the code you use. Um, that's also the code you use on like, if a woman comes in for a prenatal visit, but has another concern like depression or something else like that, and you treat it, that's the same thing. 22 is increased procedural services, so a hard surgery, like a lots of adhesions and a C-section. 52 is reduced services, so if you completed a procedure, um, if the completed completed procedure was not performed, so for example, like a self-injectomy for a tubal, if you only do the left side, then it's a reduced procedure. 53 is a discontinued procedure, so like a failed IUD or uh, endometrial biopsy. And then 57 is what you can add on for decision for surgery. This is just a reminder of the different codes and how how each level is different. So if you have an established patient, yes. The decision for surgery, is that like a preoperative counseling visit? What when do you Yes, yeah, so it can be. So if if the patient comes in for like say abnormal uterine bleeding and you go through everything and they decide that day that they want surgery, you can put that modifier on. I don't use it very often, honestly. I let like our billing people figure that out. But if you should see that one in the test, that's what it's used for. Okay. Yeah. I never heard of that. Do you get paid for um, procedures that were failed? Like if you had an EMB that didn't work or? You can. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it's a reduced... RBU value, but because you attempted, I think you get a little bit of something, whether they actually like pay you for that from the insurance company is questionable, right? Like we can code all day long, but it does not mean that they'll actually pay you, but you should get some like work RBU assigned to that. Okay. Uh, so for an established patient, you have to have two of the three categories. So either history, exam, or medical decision-making. And I would say for the majority of us, we'll, we'll get all the points in history and then medical decision-making are kind of the two that we hit. And then you can also do it based off of time. So the minimum amount of time is what's listed on the bottom. Um, so I think like for me, I almost always build based off of time. So. I just, you know, remember that 25 minutes or greater is always a 99214, and then it kind of incrementally goes down. We almost never use like the 99212 or the nine, and never use the 99211. So just a reminder that these are the ones for established patients. Then for new patients, uh, the timing is a little bit different. So 30 minutes, I always just think 30 minutes. And so the a 99203 is going to be your 30 minute one. And this one, you have to have all three of the components to be able to build to that level, or you can build on time. It's just easier to remember time. Um, but for new patients, you have to do the whole, like the whole HPI, all the medical decision making, and the severity of the problem. That's all, all of those are important to get you to that level three in the exam. Okay, question. Woman presents for evaluation and treatment of abnormal uterine bleeding. You confirm that her symptoms are likely related to endometriosis and review your treatment options. And she decides immediately that she'd like to try an IUD. Insertion of the device is performed at the same visit. 
and she experiences no complication, which component of her visit must be documented in order to bill for a separate evaluation and management service code? The counseling tag? Yep, correct. So you wanna do the counseling time for post-evaluation and that's that modifier 25 that needs to be added. Okay, 22, or excuse me, 29 year old experiences an uncomplicated birth of her first child. She presents to the office three weeks later with worsening depressed mood since delivery. She reports extreme fatigue, difficulty sleeping uh, beyond what is attributable to care of a newborn. She is worried that she is not bonding with her infant and feels overwhelmed with guilt. Her EPS score is 10, which is high. You diagnose and treat her for postpartum depression, which is prime, which is the primary reason for billing for services outside of the global obstetric package. It's postpartum complication. I did this uh, true learn question. Yes. So anytime you have a complication or something else that's outside of like normal, normal pregnancy, then you can bill it as an office visit. You just have to make sure that you document exactly why it's getting billed. Okay, sexually active 16 year old adolescent presents for a physical exam for medical clearance to participate in softball at school. You do not perform a breast exam or pelvic exam, but you counsel the patient about sexual health and vaccination against HPV. What is the most accurate classification of this encounter for billing purposes? What was that? I said C. C, yes, preventative medicine visit. Very good. Are these all making sense? These were the CREOG questions on that like new countdown to CREOG or quiz that they're doing. So hopefully they kind of reflect what the actual test is. Okay, now it just is like kind of piecemeal on different weird topics that show up on the CREOG. Um, and I tried to take the information from what's in the CREOG objectives and put it into for just important things that are easy to miss because we don't utilize them all the time. So communication strategies for patient handoffs. Um, ACOG recommends using iPass the baton, which we don't use. We usually use SBAR. Uh, it defines the patient handoff as a process for guiding the handoff process, um, or a process for guiding the handoff process should include the following. So it should have some interactive communication, limited interruptions, a process for verification, and an opportunity to review any historical data. That should all be contained in the time that you're using for um, patient handoffs. And then IPASS is introduction, patient assessment situation, and any safety concerns. The baton is background actions, timing, ownership, and next. Uh, so if you get questions on like, what does that mean? Sometimes I think I've seen like, you know, what are the components of I pass the baton? Then you want to just try to remember what each one is. So background actions, timing, ownership, next, what's happening next, and the introduction, patient assessment, situation, and safety concerns. Okay, effective patient physician communication, which is Committee Opinion 587. They talk about interviewing techniques to help the physician's ability to effectively and compassionately communicate information. Um, and that it's a key to success. They have two different ones, aid it and respect. And respect is the one that's used to help promote physicians' awareness of their own cultural biases and to develop rapport with patients from different cultural backgrounds. I don't know how, I don't know how they're gonna focus CREAG this year, but with what, everything that's been going on in the world, I have a feeling that some of this stuff is gonna start to creep into that test a little bit more. So aid it uh, is, when you walk into the room, acknowledge the patient, an introduction or welcome, um, duration or time expectation, an explanation, and a thank you. And those are kind of all the things that you should be utilizing. You want to try to smile, have good eye contact, and stop what you're doing so the customer or the person knows um, that they are important. You want to welcome the patient, state your name, where what your role is in their, their care. Um, Share the information about how long things are going to be happening or how long you're expected to be with that patient. Explain kind of what the test is or you know what your thought process is, and then make sure you give a thank you at the end of the visit. The respect model is a little bit more in depth. Uh, 
So you, it stands for rapport, empathy, support, partnership, explanations, cultural competency, and trust. And listed on the side as kind of all the different components that they um, talk about for each of those. I'm not going to go through them all, uh, but the, this one I think will be one of the ones that they're like, you know, which models can you use to establish good patient communication? And the respect model is going to be the one that delves more into cultural competencies. Okay, principle-based ethics. So principle-based ethics is kind of when we talk about autonomy, non-malfeasance, benefits, beneficence, and justice, and it's based off of those principles. And there's a couple other ethical models that you'll see too. So respect for patient autonomy is the personal rule of the self that is both free from controlling uh, inferences by others and from personal limitations that prevent mean meaningful choice, which includes inadequate understanding. Non-malfeasance is the obligation to avoid doing harm. Beneficence is that the physician must act in a manner that will likely benefit the patient. And then we have justice, and that's the principle of rendering to others what is due to them. And this one is the most complex principle that we see in ethics, and that's secondary to the role of the physician in allocating allocation of limited medical resources in the broader community, which I mean, right now we're seeing a lot of. Um, just some other definitions is stewardship of healthcare resources. So given our legitimate concerns about healthcare spending, the traditional dogma that cost should never influence bedside clinical judgment in the absence of explicit cost containment rules has really become problematic. And we continue to see like cost-effective care. And then rationing um, and parsimonious medicine. So rationing is implicitly withholding of beneficial resources from some patients for others, and parsimonious is limiting use of wasteful tests or treatment. Other ethical approaches are virtue-based, virtue um, care-based, and then feminist ethics, communitarian ethics, and case-based reasoning, which we'll go through briefly. So virtue-based relies on qualities of character that just um, dispose healthcare professionals to make choices and decisions that achieve the well being of patients, respect for their autonomous choice. So it includes trustworthiness, prudence, fairness, fortitude, temperance, integrity, self effacement, and compassion. And using those principles, they try to help make ethical decisions. Care based ethics is, directs attention to dimensions of moral experiences, often excluded from or neglected by traditional ethics theory. Uh, it's concerned primarily with responsibilities that arrive from attachment to others rather than the impartial principles so emphasized in many other ethical theories. So the moral foundations of, a, of ethics of care are located not in the rights and duties, but rather in commitment, empathy, compassion, caring, and love. And I think you kind of see this, ca this care-based one more when you're having somebody that's not the pa not the patient as the decision maker because you have to really identify what their commitment to the patient is. Feminist ethics is uh, uses tools of feminism theory to examine issues in at least three distinct ways: how con uh, conceptions of sex often distort people's view of the world, how gendered thinking has distorted the tools that philosophers and bioethics used to examine ethical issues and to call attention to and attempting to redress the ways that gender concepts have produced constraints on women. Communitarian ethics is challenges that primarily um, or prim primacy are often attributed to personal autonomy in contemporary bio biomedical ethics. So it really emphasizes a, communi a community's other shared values, ideals, and goals, and suggests the need of the larger community may take present precedence in some cases over the rights and desires of the individual. And then care-based reasoning is looking at ethics, ethical decisions made um, by precedent, things that have already been decided. So I think you just have to have like a, a brief understanding of which, what each of these are. I could see them ask like, you know, what type of ethics is being utilized in this scenario? Okay, patient autonomy. So autonomy assumes the ability to understand and apply relevant information in making clinical judgments. And it's kind of the more certain I am the patient has decisional capacity, the more likely I am to honor his or her decision, whether you agree with it or not. A choice is autonomous if it's voluntary, informed, um, made by a competent agent. Okay, And 
that question is really, does the patient have understanding of the situation and the consequences of their decision? And the decision is based on rational reasoning. If you determine that the patient's choice is not autonomous, it does not need to be respected and strong paternalism under the guidance of non-malfeasance is what prevails. And that's mostly in emergency situations where we're talking about that, where the patient um, may not be in the right capacity to make their own decisions and you may not have somebody available to help you make those decisions. That's their caregiver. Okay, the definition of paternalism is interference of the state or individual with another person against their will, justified by the claim that the person interfered with uh, will be better off or protected from harm. This model is not appropriate when the patient is competent to make informed decisions. Strong paternalism is justified in the following conditions. The patient is at risk of serious preventable harm. The paternalistic action will probably prevent the harm. The projected benefits to the patient of the paternalistic action outweighs its risk to the patient and the least a non um, autonomy restrictive alternative that will secure the benefits and reduce the risk is adopted. So in decision making and consent, competence is really the legal ability to make decisions and it's not affected by education, religious beliefs or cultural patterns. Decisional capacity is objective and that's the ability to make decisions and the criteria to determine decisional capacity falls in the following. And so demonstration of a choice reasonable outcome of that choice is understood. There's a rational bias, um, bias of the choice. There's an ability to understand the choice and the actual understanding of the choice. So a lot of times when we see, when we see patients that may have like a power of attorney or their caregivers are making their decisions for them, you know, the decisional capacity is something that we can somewhat evaluate, but that's a lot of times when we're sending them to like neuropsych to kind of be evaluated to see if they do have decisional capacity. If they do have that, then the competence is really decided by um, the court to determine if they need a power of attorney or not. Shared decision-making is a process where both patients and physicians share information, express treatment um, preference, preferences and differences, I don't know why pressure got in there, and agree on a treatment plan. So there's a, the partnership model, the gather up model, and the respect model. So the partnership model increases patient involvement and care through negotiation and consensus building between the patient and the physician. And in this model, the physician uses a precipitatory style of conversation. A uh, precipitatory style of conversation. The gather model is composed of six elements of counseling. It's greet, ask, tell, help, explain, and return. And that model is used to help maximize communication as well as confidentiality. It, and that can be used with adolescents and in family planning discussions is primarily where um, our committee opinions recommend that. And then we already touched on the respect model, which again is that helping us communicate with um, different cultural backgrounds and ensuring awareness of our own cultural bias. Okay, informed consent. Consent is the willing acceptance of a medical intervention by a patient after adequate disclosure by the physician of the nature of the intervention with its risks and benefits uh, and of the alternatives with their risks and benefits. So it's quite detailed. There's two major elements. You have to have comprehension and they have to be giving you free consent. Comprehension is defined as the patient's awareness and understanding of her situation and possibilities and implies that she is given adequate information about her diagnosis prognosis and alternative treatment choices, including the option of no treatment and free consent is intentional and voluntary, um, excuse me, intentional voluntary choices that authorize someone else. What is this? Um, so for your free consent, it cannot be, it cannot be driven by somebody else. In the context of medicine, it has to be an individual who freely authorizes a medical intervention in their life. I'll change that, I don't know what happened there. Okay, um, informed consent, again, it's the consent is based on the disclosure of information. It's not just the form. It's really the discussion between you and the patient. And it's really important to document the things that you discussed, not just sign the consent. The exception of the rule of informed consent are a couple different situations. So emergency situations in which consent is unattainable, the patient is not competent or capable of giving consent and an appropriate surrogate decision maker is not available. 
and when informed consent is overridden by another obligation. So therapeutic privilege, which is the limited privilege of a physician to withhold information from the patient and the belief that the information about the patient's medical condition and options will seriously harm the patient. <clears throat> um, and sometimes patients kind of ref like refuse to get counseling too about their instances. So we recently had that patient that had cervical cancer um, that it was like a really long drawn out conversation because she, she didn't want that information. So we just have to remember that there's some caveats to that. Okay, prologue question. For each patient, indica indicate the adequacy of informed consent process. Uh, you can say a adequate or inadequate. 24 year old female is to undergo C section. Her OB discusses the purpose of surgery, risks, benefits, and answers her questions. The hospital consent document is signed and witnessed, and the patient is taken to the operating room where a colleague will do the C section. Adequate. Okay. Um, the next one is a 34 year old female has requested that she be pre uh, prescribed an IUD, the gynecologist at the, the gynecologist as the nurse um, to have the patient sign a consent, asks the nurse to have the patient sign a consent form that re-enters re and immediately proceeds to insert the ID, IUD. Inadequate. Yeah. Um, a 74-year-old female is in the preoperative care unit before getting a hysterectomy. The attending gynecologist who is on his way to the hospital instructs the resident to attain the informed consent to proceed with the operation. I think it's adequate. That's what we do. <laughs> So all of those are actually inadequate. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so for the first one, I think it's primarily because the colleague is going to do the C-section and the colleague never spoke with the patient. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, that's okay. So In your previous power slide, you had mentioned that you just have to have discussion, you have to have um, free will, and then consent, which means risk and benefit. So that doesn't have to necessarily be with the person doing it. Well, I didn't mention anything about the, with the person doing it. I think it's considered still inadequate though, because the person that is doing it, like never even met this patient before they went to do the C-section, right? Mm. So I think that's where they're getting that, why they, why Prolog felt like it was inadequate. Um, I think we're all, we all understand why B is inadequate. And then the last one, again, the attending is the one that takes um, responsibility for the patient. So if the attending did not have a good conversation with this patient about the risks and benefits of um, hysterectomy or was present with the resident like on initial discussion, that would be inadequate. If the attending talked to the patient in the clinic and discussed everything, and then the that resident would. didn't talk about it. Yeah, so that's what happens for us most of the time, right? Is like, we see them, the attending sees them in the office. We counsel them about all the risks and benefits of surgery. We document that we did that. And you guys do this too. You document that we did all that. And then they just sign that form the day of surgery. Um, so that's adequate consent because they had, you know, they got all of the information. They were talked about all of the options. Um, it was documented appropriately in the chart. The form itself is not the adequate consent component. Okay. All right. A little bit about advanced directives. It's the preferences for treatment and the appointment of a healthcare surrogate in the event that the individual is unable to make her own decisions. Durable power of attorney or healthcare proxy is actually a legal document in which a person is appointment, appointed to make healthcare decisions in the event of another person um, is incapable of making her decisions. And the, de the designated person has the right to accept or deny medical treatment. And you can designate a, second, a secondary proxy as well. And then your living will is a document that outlines circumstances under which a person would want to refuse or terminate certain life prolonging treatments. Um, so you can have an advanced directive that lists like who you want, what kind of care you want, and if there's an individual um, that you want to make your decisions, but unless you have an attorney or a legal document actually sign it, 
it's not considered a durable power of attorney or healthcare proxy. Okay, decision maker for an incompetent person. This is um, determined by law and it's generally a family member specified by statute or court and it can change based off of where you, which state you're in. So um, you just have to be cognizant like when you go to whatever state you may practice in the future, just know like who's the next decision maker for the patient. Usually it's like spouse next, but if they're not married, then sometimes it'll reflex to a family, a family member. Um, surrogates are bound by, by one of the three standards. So they substitute judgment. It's doing what the incompetent patient would want, pure autonomy. I'm implementing the incompetent patient explicit interest or best interest standard, like parents making decisions um, that act in the best interest of their child. Okay, termination of patient care. So the patient is someone a physician is treating or who reasonably expects treatment from a physician. And reason reasons for terminating professional relationships are the, the ones that are below. So just fundamental disagreement over treatment, patient non-compliance with treatment, disruptive behavior, failure to make an effort to pay for services or limitation of practice by the physician. So if it's outside of your scope. And then refusal to treat is different. It's can, you can refuse to treat in a couple instances. So you, the condition is beyond the physician's competence to treat, like I'm not doing plastic surgery. <laughs> Sorry, friends. Um, limited number of patients in the physician's practice that can be safely treated or to limit the number of patients. Procedures that the physician considers immoral, they can also refuse to treat. However, um, they have to give patients accurate and prior notice of personal moral commitments when the patient comes to them. They need to refer the patient to other providers in a timely manner to make sure that the patient can get those procedures. And then an emergency where referral is not possible or the patient's physical or mental health might be affected, the provider is obligated to provide medically indicated services, um, which I think this is mostly surrounding termination. And interesting, like this last one, we've seen women die because people haven't intervened. So they're supposed to. Um, refer refusal to treat based on race, sex, ethnicity, disability, or religion is illegal in the US. Okay, termination of a patient. So requirements before you can terminate patient care include notifying the patient in advance in writing and provide a reason for, for the termination of care, provide information to help the patient find another physician to provide care, provide care for a, sp a specified time period, communicated in writing by certified mail sufficient to allow the patient to transfer care, Give special considerations to pregnant patients. If they're in the third trimester, they should continue under the physician's care until birth. Um, check the contracts with health plans to determine if there are restrictions on the physician's ability to terminate the patient-physician relationship. It's important that it's, it has to be in writing and usually there's a time limit of at least 30 days. Okay, chaperones and sexual relationships. I would hope that this is easy don't have sex with your patients. That's not right. And you should always try to have a chaperone with you, whether you're a male or female in the exam room to help um, decrease the risk of somebody coming back and saying that you did something inappropriate. So these are just the things that you should not do. Um, I don't think we have to go into that, all that in detail. Okay, termination of life. So competent individuals may legally discontinue their own life-sustaining treatment. Surrogates may discontinue the life-sustaining treatments of other individuals if permitted by state law. And euthanasia, um, I think this is changing a little bit as we continue, but previously it was not permitted in any American jurisdiction. Now we're seeing some states have some other palliative, me palliative measures that are allowed. Okay. Next question, 19 year old G3P2 comes to your clinic with an unintended pregnancy. Her LMP occurred 10 weeks ago. She's uncertain if she wants to continue this pregnancy. You are a physician who does not perform abortions for reason, reasons of conscience. In these circumstances, you should. E. 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 Good job guys. Okay. Do y'all want a break or you want to keep going? Keep going. 
Just buzz through it and get it done. Okay. Elements of professional liability. I told you all, this lecture is so boring to me. Because there's like no clinical medicine happening at all. Okay, we're going to go over those topics that are below there. So negligence and professional um, medical liability. So medical liability lawsuits is a civil action claim filed by a patient against a physician that asks for monetary compensation for physical, mental, or financial injury caused by the physician's professional negligence. The plaintiff is the person who um, initiates the action and the defendant is the person whom the action is filed against. The plaintiff must have a preponderance of evidence um, to say that you uh, did all of the four things below. Okay, and you have to you have to have evidence that proves that you had all these four elements and then failed in her care. You owed her a duty of care. You breached that duty. The breach of duty or negligence caused her injury, and the suffered damage and she suffered damages as a result of that injury. Um, medical liability malpractice. So medical malpractice requires the demonstration of negligence or some standard practice that caused harm. Medical malocurrence is defined as a bad outcome that is unrelated to the quality of care delivered by the healthcare team. So medical and surgical complications that can be anticipated and represent unavoidable risks of appropriate medical care is kind of that medical malocurrence, but not malpractice because it wasn't a negligence. Okay, medical liability. How do you reduce it? Be courteous, use printed materials in the patient's language, explain adverse outcomes, don't hide any information, write, dictate all notes when the service is performed, try to avoid abbreviations, do not use trailing zeros, do not destroy records, amend them by crossing out. Uh, you wanna amend them by crossing out with one line or write error with your initials. Don't criticize patients or other professionals on medical records and keep a copy of all um, prescriptions, which we don't need to do so much and write legibly, especially with consents. Okay, duty of care. Duty of care is established when you start your physician patient relationship. So in other words, you offer to treat the patient and she accepts your services. You can refuse not to establish a relation or you can refuse not to establish a relationship. However, there's some expectations. One of those being residents the second is if the patient's an ER patient and you also cannot with EMTALA. So depending on like, um, so for EMTALA for us, like if we're getting in transfer of OB patients, we like, we can't, we can't just not care for them. Uh, patient physician relationship can be established without face-to-face -face contact. And this in the age of um, like e-advice and things like that is super important. So advice over the phone or by email establishes your patient relationship. Um, if they're a, men a member of a managed care plan with physician, like with an um, insurance company and you're part of that pool, they can also be considered an established patient. An appointment made for treatment of a life-threatening condition can also establish a patient in your practice. Any questions about that? Uh, so for instance, here, I, for whatever reason, um, sometimes have patients like message me that I've never seen in the office before, nor, nor has anyone else. And I um, will usually send their message to the nurse to like reach out to them, but I won't answer their question over e advice. Okay, breach of duty. So the plaintiff must prove that you there was a breach of duty um, or care by either one, an act of omission or commission or an act of omission. So you either did something that you weren't supposed to do or you did not do something you should have done. And it's based on the standard of care. And that's why ACOG is like so vague in all of their committee opinions about decision making, right? They give you like this big leeway <clears throat> uh, to ensure that you hopefully stay within the standard of care. So it's care that would ordinarily um, provi be provided by physicians practicing in the same specialty. This is established by testimonies from expert witnesses. The event alone demonstrates negligence without, you know, without expert witness, like an instrument left inside the abdomen in surgery, um, common knowledge tests, na national medical specialty guidelines and hospital protocols and policies is kind of where they get that standard of care. Uh, causation has to be established too, and they have to show that your negligence directly caused her injury. <clears throat> and it has to be to a reasonable degree of medical probability and you do not need absolute proof or proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It just has to be a reasonable degree. 
And the patient also has to prove she suffered physical, financial, or emotional injury as the result of those things. So special damages, um, special damages are economic damages. So compensation, it compensates patients for expenses that can be provided to be directly, directly caused by the injury. So medical costs, rehab, lost wages. General damages are non-economic damages and those compensations are intangible in nature. And that's usually like pain and suffering and disfigurement. And then punitive or exemplary damages are compensation for egregious or outrageous conduct, even if it's not intentional, um, usually excluded by medical professional liability, liability insurance. So this would be something you get to pay for by yourself. So if you were like rest, recklessly disregarding the well-being, well-being of the patient, there was clear incompetence, influence of substances, like you came to work intoxicated or failure to respond. All right, 37 year old woman underwent a right oophorectomy for a suspected benign cystic teratoma diagnosed by pelvic ultrasound. The fin final pathology findings were consistent with the normal ovary. Postoperative review of the ultrasound images revealed that the teratoma was on the left side. While the radiologist report mistakenly indicated the mass was on the right side. The risk management office was notified of the situation. In addition to disclosing the error to the patient, the surgeon should obviously assign fault to the radiologist. It's like anesthesia, always your fault. It's not that one. D. What was? D. D? Oh. <laughs> Apologize. Apologize. Apologize for the year. Okay, government requirements affecting medical practice. We're gonna just briefly go through all the things that are listed there. Okay, MTALA, it ensures that everyone who seeks medical help from a hospital emergency department receives the appropriate screening and treatment regardless of ability to pay. It includes all hospitals that participate in Medicare and have a dedicated emergency department. Labor and delivery units can meet the criteria and are also included. Emergency medical condition is um, symptoms severe enough that if the patient is not given immediate care, there is a reasonable expectation that there's going to be serious um, jeopardy of the patient's health. There could be serious impairment of bodily function or a serious dysfunction of a bodily organ. So the times that I've seen this is when people are trying to be transferred to different spots um, for care because the, the care at, at one hospital might not be adequate enough. Um, and I've, ha I've definitely had people refuse to take patients, which is silliness because like, if you're really that concerned, you know, like for instance, a cardiac cath and the patient's at a hospital where they can't, you know, they don't have cardiology. It's not, and you know, the, they might be having an MI or something like that. The next hospital that you send that patient to should have those services, but also cannot refuse to take them. Okay, special requirements in pregnancy for screening patients for emergency conditions. You have to consider the health of the fetus. If possible, threat to fetus, um, then you can't, cannot transfer the patient. If having contractions and patient is in true labor, which is an emergency medical condition, unless certified professional determines she's in false labor, you can't transfer the patient. If patients, um, if a pregnant patient is having contractions and has an emergency medical condition, then the patient is not stabilized until the baby and the placenta are delivered. So those are important when we're talking about trying to transfer patients. So like you shouldn't put somebody in an ambulance and transfer them up to us if they're actively in labor, right? Like if the patient is in preterm labor and um, she's actively contracting and it's not ideal just to like start her on mag, try to stop the contractions and then send her in the ambulance from Racine or Kenosha to us while she's still contracting really frequently, right? The process would be to deliver the baby and then transfer the baby out if it's needed and stabilize the patient. Um, so you have two options. You can treat and stabilize the patient and then transfer the patient to another hospital, which is better able to provide necessary care, but not if you're having other issues in pregnant patients. Okay, criteria for transfer of unstable patient. The patient requests the transfer after being informed of her rights. 
you need to document that request in writing or she refuses your recommendation for transfer to another hospital despite informed consent and you just have to document that refusal in writing as well. And your EMTALA obligations is if on call you must respond to request um, to screen and treat the patient in a timely manner. You cannot refuse to accept a transfer if you are capable of caring for the patient. You may be on call for more than one hospital at the same time. Um, you may schedule elective surgeries during call, hours on call. You can't have a patient transferred to your office or other hospital for your convenience. You must find a replacement if you are not available. And if you don't do those things, you can get a fine of up to $50,000. So not ideal. Okay, uh, HIPAA. It was adopted in 1996. It provides stronger healthcare provisions for people leaving jobs and those who um, and those with pre-existing conditions. There's three main operations in this law: it's transaction and code set, security and privacy of individual identifiable health information, and then protected health information is created or received by healthcare provider, plan or employer. It identifies the patient and it relates to past, present, future physical or mental health. So the three components with transaction and code sets, it standardizes and simplifies how health information is stored and submitted in electronic format. The security rule is a rule of storage of health information. So I've definitely seen like, which rule is this under for the HIPAA, um, for HIPAA? So it's electronic signature requirements, physical storage safeguards, tra transmission safeguards, and access safeguards. And then privacy of the um, health information is the ethical and legal obligations to safeguard PHI, including anyone who conducts the following activities. So submitting claims, checking patient eligibility or coverage, and requesting a pre or referral, receiving payments, notices of payments, or um, explanation of benefits. Okay, so security rule itself is 41 specifications. It designates a security officer at the institution and analyzes risks confidentiality, establishes procedures for auditing, protecting access to computer files, using encryption, using data protection programs, and establishing reporting policies. And the privacy rule is that the, um, it notifies patients of their privacy rights. You have to provide training to staff, only disclose information as permitted by the privacy rule, and it discloses only the minimum information to non-providers, um, providers, per to permit patients to get a copy, it permits patients to get a copy of their records and the patient may ask to amend records as well. And that's all in the privacy rule. Now the patient can ask to amend a record, but you don't have to agree to it. Okay, um, which is on this slide. So patient has the right to expect all the PHI and request correction of inaccuracies, but you don't have to honor the request, uh, but you have to have a written justification for, re for refusal. Consent for a patient required for disclosure of PHI for purposes other than treatment and treatment, payment, and operations. So, I mean, technically with HIPAA, if we're asking for information for treatment for patients on labor and delivery, um, we don't necessarily have to have a consent for that. But everybody asks for it because they're so concerned about violating HIPAA, so we do it anyways. So if you violate one of the HIPAA policies, that's $100 per incident, max of $25,000 per year. Um, you can also have $250,000 and uh, 10 years in prison for intentional misuse of PHI. Okay, reasons that HIPAA can be violated, uh, treatment or transfer to hospital to, uh, hospital to schedule procedures, payment, legally sanctioned, so like research audit, research if patient is unidentifiable, communicable diseases, suspected abuse, legal action to a physician's lawyer, subpoenaed, or verbal agreement of the patient. Okay, these are some other just like tidbits. So your national provider identifier is a unique permanent identification number for healthcare providers who bill for their services. It stays with you forever does not convey any specific information about healthcare providers. It's just used for electronic transactions. Okay, Medicare billing fraud. This is when you submit a false claim or use of inaccurate statements to secure reimbursement. It can be billing for services not provided, misrepresenting the diagnosis, soliciting or offering, offering or getting kickbacks. And then False Claims Act is knowingly submitting a fraudulent claim to a federal healthcare program you can go to prison, you can get fined. Don't do these things. 
Okay, anti-kickback statute is, um, its purpose is to ensure providers make decisions about patient referrals on the basis of what is in the patient's best interest, not on the basis for financial gain. Again, you can go, you know, bad things can happen if you decide to do this, felony, criminal fines. Um, so some of the things that used to happen is like you would open an imaging center and then you would be sending all of your patients to that imaging center to get that kickback. So those are the kind of things that they're really looking for. Um, safe harbors are business arrangements that violate the anti-kickback statute, but Office of Inspector General has cleared it, which is kind of a weird, just a weird thing. Okay, Stark Law is for self-referral prohibition. So it prohibits a physician from making a referral for certain specified services to an entity with which the physician or any member of the physician's immediate family has financial relationships. Expectation is a, a physician service. Um, you or another physician in your group performs or supervises in office ancillary services and compensation paid to you by provider to which you refer um, is based on fair market value and not affected by volume of referrals. So the list of healthcare services that you can see are like clinical lab services, PTOT, radiology and imaging, um, DME supplies and, the, and other things like that can be in those things that are exemptions. You just really wanna be careful what you're doing. Okay, anti-discrimination laws. We have the Civil Rights Act. Um, Title VI, it prohibits discrimination based on the national or um, national origin. If you're receiving federal funded assistance, it needs to be, you need to take reasonable steps to provide language assistance at no cost. And it depends on size of practice, size of patient population, the nature of services, how often you encounter languages, and how often pa patients with limited English proficiency come into your office. Americans with Disabilities Act. Disability is defined as physical and mental impairments that substantially limit one or more major life activities. It applies to practices with 15 or more people. Um, provisions, it has, you cannot discriminate against job applicants or current employees on the basis of disabilities. You must make reasonable accommodations and you are not required to hire an unqualified job applicant with a disability as long as the decision is based on objective criteria related to the job. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It oversees the standard of care and handling and um, handling and managing hazardous chemicals and universal precautions. It's to ensure a safe environment. It can conduct unannounced inspections of your office, OSHA can, and you can be subject to criminal or civil, civil penalties if you don't follow it. Um, there's almost always like a binder that has all the information about if you get exposed to a hazardous chemical. Exposure control plan with bloodborne pathogens. It mandates universal precautions for handling blood or other bodily fluid and engineering workplace controls. It has PPE at no extra cost for dealing with these things. Um, it talks about like housekeeping procedures and communication of hazards and employee training. All those things are all under OSHA. Okay, clinical laboratory improvement amendments. Um, the objective of this program is to ensure quality laboratory testing by studying um, for the conditions that all laboratories must meet to be certified to perform testing for human specimens. You can get a waiver. Uh, they can also randomly inspect your areas for provider performed microscopy procedures. There's a different certificate and it's $200 and has to be renewed every two years. So that I think was one of the questions way back in the day. Um, but because we do wet mounts, we have to make sure that we know about the CILA and that that's part of what we do is that provider perform microscopy procedures. Okay, Fair Labor Standard Acts. It talks about child labor, minimum wage and overtime pay, anti-discrimination laws, um, go over sexual harassment, pregnancy discrimination, age discrimination and equal pay act. And FMLA, it, you have to have at least 50 employees to be under the FMLA. And it allows for job protection of unpaid leave for up to 12 weeks in a year. It must, um, your employer must continue your group benefits and you must have the same or equivalent position on return. And the states can add to regulations under that, but it, at minimum has to be those. 
Okay. A patient's laboratory reports uh, are requested by another physician who is also treating the patient. The documents are retrieved by your secretary from your electronic medical records. She prints out the patient's laboratory reports and faxes them to their requested physician. According to the HIPAA, the transmission of this information by means of a paper to a paper fax would be regulated by. A? No. Nope. B. So painful these are. Okay. Case vignettes. Describe the type of industry support um, of CME that represents a potential conflict of interest. Either A, a high potential for conflict of interest, or B, low potential for conflict of interest. Who wants to read the first one and give me an answer? I will. Okay. Uh, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical rep offers to provide you with a check to cover the cost of attending a CME conference of your choice. It sounds like a high potential for a conflict of interest. Excellent. A former colleague of yours is organizing a commercially sponsored CME activity and offers to obtain funds from the company to pay for your flight to attend the activity. High potential for conflict of interest. Yes. During a CME conference, dinner is sponsored by a surgical device company at the same time as an educational session. Low potential. Okay. A pharmaceutical company financially supports a CME activity, but has no role in choosing the speakers or topics. Um, I feel like that's a low potential. I think your thought processes are all fine. Anytime anyone sponsors a CME activity, they list it as a high, a high risk. Um, this one for the surgical device at the same time as an educational session. I think that's why it's high. And of course, um, support CMA activity, but has no role in choosing the speakers or conferences. I think it's just because it's a pharmaceutical company and that's supporting your CME. And it's not like your direct institution. Okay, physician reporting and profiling. Just a couple more things. So the state physician profiling is information that states make accessible to the public to help them make better healthcare decisions. So it can include your primary work study as an address, education and training, your medical board discipline um, actions, if you have any. If you ever had your hospital privileges revoked or restricted, medical professional liability judgments and claims settled against you or any criminal convictions. So the National Practitioner Data Bank is the central source for, of information about those disciplinary actions that are taken against physicians, dentists, and other healthcare um, professionals. It's operated by the Department of Health and Human Services. And the, when a query is requested to verify a, prevent, a provider's credentials to obtain privileges, and um, then that's repeated every two years. And this is not accessible by the public. Who reports to the National Provider Data Bank includes state and medical dental boards, hospitals, and other healthcare entities, professional societies, and then medical professional liability insurers all for, um, all report to that. So it's really important, like if you if you get named to the N, the NP um, DB, you can you can't like you generally can't reverse it, but you can attach a document that kind of explains like what happened and why, which is really important. You can contest. Um, you can contest some of it too, but it doesn't mean that they'll listen and take it off. Okay, so Health Integrity and Protection Data Bank, you have the National Healthcare Fraud and Abuse Data Collection Program. It's developed to reduce the financial burden on the healthcare system by, by fraud and abuse, and it helps gather information about adverse actions taken against healthcare providers um, or suppliers. The information is licensure and certification, exclusion for participation. Um, you can, I'm sorry, you can have licensure and certification actions so they can remove, revoke your licensure 
you can have exclusion for participating in federal and state health care programs, so like Medicaid, Medicare, you can get um, criminal convictions, civil judgments are all possible repercussions from that. Information that's not included in this are the settlements with no admission or findings of liability and medical professional liability claims, but that aren't completed. Um, so state and federal healthcare agencies can look at that. Health plans can also look at that and individual healthcare practitioners, providers, and suppliers can see it as well. Okay, a little bit on insurance. Uh, HMO is a health maintenance organization and it organizes healthcare systems um, that is responsible for financing, delivery, and arrangement of compensated healthcare services or comprehensive healthcare services. And you get assigned a primary care provider and they provide and coordinate that care. Um, a preferred provider organization, which is more of like what our insurance is like. And the PPO plans negotiate preferred rates from physicians and hospitals and in turn reduces the cost for employees and members. Um, you do not need to select a PCP and you do not need referrals to see preferred advisors or providers. So with an HMO, you have to be referred to providers. With a PPO, you just have a reduced rate that's negotiated. Okay, global obstetric care includes antepartum care, delivery, and postpartum care. Okay, providers choosing to, to submit claims for global obstetric care must provide care that spans all three components of care. But, and this is which, what kind of sucks because our um, system is like this. So if that patient doesn't come back for their postpartum visit, you get a significant reduction in the amount that you're paid and you can't submit a global sad face, okay? Minimum of six antepartum visits, uh, vaginal or cesarean delivery, the post-delivery hospital visits included in this, and a minimum of one postpartum office visit is included in this. And you have to complete all of those things. So the other thing that kind of sucks is that when patients are seen at 16th Street Clinic and then come to us and then deliver with us, this also is unfortunate. Okay. What, about, so what about virtual visits? Do those count or no? You know, so I think that's going to be a new and interesting thing because virtual visits until very recently did not count. And now with the pandemic, I would assume that they, because that was like, a, that was a law that, not a law, that was a request that they made that CMS granted. So I don't know how long that will last for. When you say okay. hospital visit, do you mean grounding on them postpartum? What was that? The post delivery hospital visit is rounding on them postpartum? Yes. Okay, so you have to do all these things or else you have to just submit separate claims for like what you did, not the global. That's what you're saying? Correct. And the, the reimbursement for the separate claims is significantly less than the global. Uh, the global can be submitted as long as it was care within your group as well. It doesn't have to be a specific provider. Like as long as your group took care of them for all of these things, then the group can submit the global. Okay, I was like, man, who can ever do this? Right. That, that, makes, makes, that makes more sense. <laughs> but then who submits the global? The person that delivered them or anybody that took care of them? Who so usually what'll happen is that um, in, in the billing department, they'll collect all of our pregnant patients. And then at the end, they I think they look at like how much care was provided and then they submit the global based off the hospital and then we get reimbursed with our RVUs based off of what we actually did. Okay. Okay. Some professional liability insurance info. So there's a couple of different um, way that malpractice insurance works. You have an occurrence based claims made um, and then extended reporting and then claims paid policy. Okay, so occurrence-based is a policy insures for the any incident that occurs while the policy is in, in effect, regardless of when the claim is filed. So for occurrence, it's like while you're working for that hospital during that time frame, anytime a complaint is made, even after you leave, it's still covered under that. Does that make sense? Okay. Claims made policy um, provides coverage only for the claims that occur and were reported during the policy period when you were employed, which can cause a problem, right? Because then if you leave and somebody sues you, you're not covered if you're at a different place. And a lot of times if you had a claims made policy and you go to somewhere else, 
um, they that new malpractice insurance is also not going to cover you. So that's when we start talking about tail insurance, which is the extended reporting endorsement coverage. And that's coverage of not um, asserted claims triggered by the onset. And that took place during the policy, but you're no longer covered by it. So for claims made policy, you have to have tail coverage, which can, which can be ridiculously expensive. And we see this in Illinois a lot, like when physicians try to get out of oil, Illinois, it's really hard to leave your job if you can't afford the tail coverage and the tail coverage is sometimes like a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars which is blockers okay and then claims paid policy is all the events associated with the claim that occur while the policy is in effect it is inexpensive but can be really risky as an insurer um and it may may the insurer may look for a reason not to renew your policy also, interestingly, if you are in Florida, you don't have to have malpractice insurance, which kind of blows my mind. And that might be sometimes where you're, you're in like a claims paid policy. Any questions about those? You always want an occurrence policy. That's better for your life. Okay, some statistics. And then we're going to be done. So we have type one um, and type two errors, and then we're gonna talk about some other things. So incidents is the number of new cases over a period. Prevalence is the number total number of cases at one period of time. Type one errors are incorrect rejections of a true null hypo hypothesis or a false positive. Type two errors are failure to reject a false null hypothesis or a false negative. And I like this little cartoon. It's like type one error, you're pregnant. I mean, possible, but unlikely. And type two error is you're not pregnant, which looks like you're definitely pregnant. So <laughs> that's kind of a way to remember those two. Okay, p-value is gonna be your probability that effect, that the effect is occurring, occurring by chance. Um, and that's why we use that cutoff um, of usually 0 0.05. Mode is the value that appears the most. And then chi-score test is the goodness of the fit and compares the observed result to the expected result. Okay, measurement of diagnostic test performance. So sensitivity is your ability to choose a diagnosis, um, correctly diagnose a disease. Specificity is the ability to correctly exclude a disease. So sensitivity, correctly diagnose, specificity, correctly exclude, Positive predictive value is the chance a positive result is correct. Negative predictive value is going to be the chance that the negative result is correct. Okay. This little chart you just want to remember in your mind. And then we're going to go over some questions here um, in just a second as well. Levels of evidence they also talk about. So level one is usually um, randomized control trials. Level two is going to be system, uh, system reviews or individual cohort studies. And level three are always like case controlled, individual case controlled. Level four is going to be small case series and level five is going to be expert opinion. So it's kind of just goes down in that route of, you know, what provides the best to the least. Okay, some study design and try to remember like what's a cohort, what's a case controlled, what's a cross-sectional study. Um, if you're going to assign an intervention, you go into that experimental study. If there's a random allocation, this one's pretty easy. You get a randomized control trial. If it's not random, you go non-randomized. If it's an observational study, if you have a comparison group, you're going to go into analytical studies and then determining um, what the direct the direction of exposure is, is how you determine cohort case control or cross-sectional. So case control are patients who already have a specific condition, and those are compared to people who do not. And the goal is to identify the exposure that causes the disease. You can't provide a relative risk for exposure because they already have it. And it's most useful for uncommon diseases when you're looking at case controls. Cohort is identifying a group of patients who already are taking a particular treatment or have an exposure, and they are followed forward and compared to the group without the exposure, which is kind of the nurse health study with all of our um, uh, menopausal information stuff. It can be completed retrospectively and you can determine a relative risk for that one. And then cross-sectional is the relationship between a disease and other factors at one point in time, okay? All right, 
some questions. In this type of study, exposures and outcomes are determined at the same time and give a snapshot of a population. Cross-sectional? Cross-sectional. Cross One point in time. Very good. Okay, you design a study in which you identify a group of patients with a rare uh, vulvar dysplasia and a secondary group of patients without the dysplasia. You then look back in time to see if there's any potential causes or exposures that can be identified. What is that type of study? Is it case controlled? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Okay, question three. In this type of study, you start with an exposure and move forward in time to the outcome of interest. These studies can be prospective or retrospective. Cohort. Cohort. Cohort studies. Perfect. All right. This is a long question. There's a lot of calculating that happens on this one. Okay, you are conducting an experiment to evaluate the performance of a new rapid diagnostic test for the identification of gonorrhea. Your results are there, okay? And they're on every slide going forward. Assuming the gold standard for diagnosis is the result of the culture, what would the sensitivity be? I guess is B. <laughs> okay. So it's the, isn't it the over gonna, all the positives? Yeah. So sensitivity is true positives. And in my little chart, it might have been different. So true positives, which is 95 over. True positives plus false negatives, which was on which is a, in total 100, which makes that D. Mm. Okay. All right. What about the specificity? You can go back to this chart just as a reminder. So that's looking at negative. So true negative over true negative plus false positive. Okay. A. a. Correct. All right. What would the positive predictive value be? Mm, let me cut it off. Let me see if I can get you back to the. Isn't it the um, like true positives over the like all positives? As in like all positive tests? It's annoying that my thing. Yes. So. So it's going to be your 95 over 97. Sorry, my picture is weird. <clears throat> and then your, it's going to ask for your negative, the negative predictive value as well. And that's, that's going to be 98 over 103. And that is the end. We made it. Do you guys have any questions about any of those things? I put this on your um, Teams drive in your folder so that you can just like run through it really quick before the test, just as a reminder. They often do ask about those laws and like what um, affects what, so. Hopefully it was somewhat helpful. I know it's really boring. Yeah, they do ask these questions and I feel like I always get them wrong and they're ones that should be easy. Mm -hmm. I'm always like, why don't I know this? Anyways, all right. And then you guys have free study time for the rest. And if you can complete that ASRM uh, one, I think it's precocious puberty, because I think that's one of the ones that sometimes is on the test as well. That would be great. Thanks, Dr. Cox. Thank you. Thank Have a great you. day. Come on. Thank you. Have a great day.